My name is Alicia McDonald, and I'm the Director of Privacy at Stanford's Center for Internet and Society here. It is exciting to co-moderate our panel on internet privacy this afternoon. The internet is a set of powerful open technologies that have transformed conversations, commerce, and culture within nations. The internet's global reach also makes for challenging governance decisions. Online privacy is a fascinating example right now. For instance, the European Union is trying to normalize privacy views of 27 nations into one e-privacy law. Getting European agreement is hard, but one thing is clear, the views of privacy rights in the EU differ from US corporate views. Who decides and how do we decide? Where do we have one world wide web and how do we respect national sovereignty when ones and zeros have no nationality. These are our challenges. The United States has uh, under 200 million internet users and China has approximately 700 million internet users so far, with more coming online every day. We desperately need fora like this one to discuss our many similar issues and speak about how we have attempted solutions. What can we learn from each other as we all invent the future together? I join past speakers in thanks to our sponsors, Tencent and Microsoft, and our co-hosts, Peking University and Stanford University. I now have the privilege of introducing our first panelist. Dan Arbuck is a technologist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF. EFF is a leading United States advocacy group working passionately on internet issues. Dan is a former engineer at Google, and he helps EFF understand the te technical aspects of privacy policies and how to make these policies effective by virtue of practical industry experience. Dan has been a tremendous voice for privacy within the community, and we are fortunate to have him here today. Dan, if you'd like to come up and present from here. Uh, sure, mm -hmm. I can do that. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Alicia, and uh, thanks to Stanford and Peking University, as well as our sponsors, Tencent and Microsoft. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so as Alicia mentioned, I work at an NGO called EFF. As a civil liberties organization, we work on many issues. Uh, for example, promoting free expression and sensible intellectual property policy uh, that doesn't infringe on user rights. But we have deep roots working on privacy. Uh, in the 1990s, we won a lawsuit in the United States that ensured the use of cryptography could not be regulated by the government, uh, but was free for all to use. Well, uh, the, the effect of the lawsuit was that that came to be in the 90s. Um, so with this ruling, the, technolo the technology of encryption could be used for the first time in the United States uh, to create truly private communications without regulation or interference. We've also actively been working on consumer privacy and think companies should respect users' privacy and have transparent privacy policies so that users can make informed choices about what services to use. So to illustrate the breadth of the concept of privacy, I want to tell two stories that might seem very different. So uh, the first story is reported in the New York Times is about a young woman who did some shopping at Target. For those who don't, may not know, Target is a US retailer sort of like a, a Walmart competitor. So they sell things like clothes and microwaves and everything under the sun. So this young woman uh, did some shopping at Target. She might have been browsing online. And then she receives an advertisement in the mail. Uh, but it's not for a microwave or anything like that. It's for baby clothes, so uh, clothes for a newborn and other items that would be for a newborn baby. Um, her father sees this and gets really angry and says, he goes, he complains to Target. He says, what are you doing? My daughter's only 16 years old. Are you trying to say that she should be getting pregnant? Why are you sending her all these baby-related advertisements? Uh, and the manager apologized. But then later over the phone, after the manager followed up, it was the father who was apologizing. As it turned out, his daughter was, in fact, pregnant. Um, which is why Target was sending those advertisements. Um, and it turns out that Target knew that she was pregnant before her own father did. And I think this is an interesting story because it, 
illustrates how pervasive tracking can be and how, how much companies can know about a person. So the second story is much more serious. It's about a human rights activist in Bahrain named Abdul Ghani Al Kanjar, who was tortured and beating for speaking out on his political views. According to Al Kanjar, uh, in between beatings, his attackers, the uniformed Bahraini police officers, would read back to him the text messages he'd sent and the phone calls he'd had uh, with other activists that were ostensibly private. Um, and this story. Al Kanjar is, is still in hiding, by the way, and, and still trying to improve the human rights situation in Bahrain. Uh, the story, I think, is, illustrates with frightening clarity how governments are able to leverage technology uh, to intercept otherwise private communications. So the story of these two, the young woman, um, we can call her Ashley, and the story of Al Kanjar are very different, but fundamentally they're both about privacy. And in particular, they're both cases when a person's expectation of privacy is violated. At EFF, we take it as axiomatic that people are entitled to private communications, free from interference or eavesdropping, and that they're entitled to transparency and choice in terms of privacy properties of what tools they use. Um, I spend a lot of my time as a tech guy focused on users, so I, I'm a little, I have some uh, touch with the policy world and the legal world, but what I'm most passionate about is tools for users, and so I want to spend the rest of my time talking about that. Um, so, fighting back, I have kind of three things here, and we'll go through each of them in turn. Uh, the first suggestion is to understand exactly what you would like to keep private and from whom you would like to keep it private. So I think as a user, it's often natural to feel overwhelmed if you don't have much technological experience. You might have a vague sense that your communications are not private, but you, you don't know what to do about it, and you, it's, it's kind of an overwhelming thing to, to think about. But if you step back and take a moment to ask yourself some questions, it will help a lot. The first question illustrated in the slide is, what am I doing? Is this a service like email or chat or text or phone where I'm trying to reach one other person? Um, and I only want that person to be able to read the communications and no one else. Or perhaps like the second situation, you're browsing the web, you're reading Wikipedia or ESPN, which is a US sports site, uh, and, you don't, and you're worried that people might be seeing your reading habits. Um, and then the third, or, or maybe another scenario, is that you're using a public forum, like uh, Weibo or Twitter, and you're trying to broadcast a message, but you want to do so anonymously. Um, all of these are different. Uh, situations, and we call them threat models in our industry. Um, and I think it's the, the first step in protecting yourself is understanding your threat model. What, what are you actually trying to accomplish? Um, so the, the next part of understanding your threat model is who do you, from whom do you want to keep things private? So in the case of Ashley, uh, let me she probably didn't want Target to be tracking her purchase history. She really probably didn't want them to be inferring that she was pregnant. And she really, really, really probably didn't want them to broad that, cast that information back to her own father. Um, in the case of Al Kanjar, he really wanted to protect the private communications he thought he was having so that they couldn't be uh, uh, spied upon by his government. So, Getting back to the threat model, understand what you're doing and understand who your adversary is. Um, these are really, really important things to do. The second piece of advice is to choose tools wisely. Uh, hold on, where are we? Uh, it looks like I lost the slide, but that's OK. Um, so you have to be very careful, and people's individual situations will vary. But when it comes to choosing tools, I recommend doing this thing which I like to call domain switching. The idea is if your adversary is, say, the United States government, then don't use a tool where the United States government has jurisdiction. Conversely, if your adversary is, for example, a, a local attacker in a, a Chinese internet cafe, then don't use a tool where that attacker will be able to, to see what you're doing. So in particular, if you, to the extent that you can, use tools that uh, are for other jurisdictions. There are also some uh, kind of general pieces of advice. 
to the extent that you can switch domains in terms of the network you're using by using what's called a virtual private network or um, a, a more serious anonymity service called Tor. These are all tools that let you kind of switch where you're connecting to the internet from and are really important tools for people who are concerned about privacy or anonymity. Um, and then the last suggestion has its own slide because I think it's so important. Um, when selecting tools, uh, the, the importance of cryptography cannot be understated. So cryptography is a technology that was in the 70s expanded uh, to a technique called asymmetric cryptography, which allowed two different people in different parts of the world to, to have a truly private communication. Um, and this is a, a watershed moment in history, and since then we've been building tools that allow people to have these private conversations. Um, and it doesn't only occur between two individuals in what we would call an end-to-end -end encrypted uh, uh, in terms of like end-to-end -end encryption, it's also important for securing access to websites. So when a user visits a website, so that the local attackers on their network can't snoop on that, and the communication between the user and the website is also private. So in summary, cryptography has a major role to play at many layers of the ecosystem. Um, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into all the ways cryptography can and should be used, um, but the technology team at EFF, of which I'm a part, is trying our best to evangelize and build tools that move the ecosystem towards more cryptography, which in turn will move uh, the world towards users having more privacy. Um, and it is our belief that people who are serious about privacy should take the time to learn about cryptography and its benefits. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dan. I now have the privilege of introducing Jennifer Granick. She is the Director of Civil Liberties at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, where she was the original Executive Director when Stanford CIS started back in 2001. In between, she's held many positions, including the Civil Liberties Director at EFF, where Dan is today. We have fairly little case law about internet privacy in the United States, and it is striking how many of these cases Jennifer has helped litigate one way or another. I think of Jennifer as the Internet's lawyer. We're very fortunate to have her here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, the topic of this panel is how people are concerned about collection of information about them and what it is that we should do about it. And I want to point out that people are concerned not only that the companies with which they interact are collecting information and profiling them, but also that the government can go to these companies and get this information. In other words, to a large extent, government has been able to outsource its surveillance and thus conduct more broad collection of information on its citizens um, for a very, very low cost. So without legal and political assurances that government will not uh, misuse or abuse its access to this information, people are going to be concerned about using modern technology. And those concerns not only have uh, civil liberties implications, but they have economic implications as well, because people will resist or be more reluctant to adopt, in, adopt innovations that could otherwise be very productive. So what I want to do um, here today is talk a little bit about these policy choices that we've made in the United States and talk a little bit about the things that have, we've done right and a little bit about the things that we've done wrong. And hopefully my goal is through um, discussing this that we would, we'll see where more safeguards could be put in place so that people will be more comfortable using the network. Um, so in the United States, we've done a number of things right. Uh, we have a uh, law, it's the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution that broadly regulates government um, surveillance and investigations of its citizens. We also have a couple of specific statutes that address privacy concerns 
more broadly. And those are or include the Privacy Act, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So what we do in these laws is we have made a distinction here in the U.S. between national security concerns that come from foreign agents and domestic national security concerns and law enforcement concerns. Um, we have uh, very careful definitions about when we consider U.S. persons to be foreign uh, national security threats. And as I said, we have this very broad Fourth Amendment, which says that the government general, which generally says that the government cannot invade a citizen's reasonable expectation of privacy unless they get a warrant. And a warrant is reviewed by a judge, and so we have separation of powers as a check and balance on uh, law enforcement and on executive force. However, in the process of formulating these laws, we have made some policy choices that either were at the time or have become, as technologies evolved, unwise. Um, those choices include that we protect the content of online communications more strictly than we protect transactional information like uh, IP addresses. We protect personally identifying information but leave uh, unprotected information that is not personally identifying. We have chosen to regulate real-time or prospective surveillance more strictly than we regulate government access to historical or stored data. Our Fourth Amendment doctrine has conflated the notion of secrecy with the notion of privacy. We have underappreciated in our law how modern technology would evolve to enable mass surveillance, and we don't have good tools for regulation of mass surveillance practices by our government. Um, we have undervalued transparency and the ability of American citizens to know what surveillance practices law enforcement is up to, and even for our own legislators to know. And we have failed to provide, as a regular matter, robust uh, remedies for when there are violations of the surveillance laws that we do have. So I want to take each of these in turn and talk about how I think we could do privacy protection better and thereby give citizens that confidence that their information is not going to be used and abused by governments. So number one is content versus transactional data. The United States protects the content of communications more than transactional data. Under the Fourth Amendment, we protect what you say when you're on a phone call, but we do not protect the numbers you dial or the numbers that dial you. Similarly, in the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, we have that same distinction. And yet, this transactional information, who you call, where your phone is, what IP address you're communicating with, and those kinds of things can be extremely revealing. Nowhere, I think, is this more apparent than in the context of location tracking. Transactional information, in other words, the data uh, that your cell phone communicates with cell towers so that the network can find where you are and route your phone call, can be used to pinpoint your physical location with a great amount of precision. Similarly, knowing the people with whom I communicate over time can tell you an immense amount of stuff about me. It can tell you my religion, it can tell you if I see a doctor, it can tell you what kind of doctor I see, who my best friends are. And as big data uh, analysis techniques evolve, increasingly this transactional data is going to be every bit, if not more revealing, than the content of a particular phone call or letter or email. So we need to take into account when we are revising or um, implementing laws on this um, that, that transactional information is very revealing. Similarly, we overprotect personal, we protect personally identifying information. The Federal Privacy Act applies to databases where the government pulls information out of those by your name or some other unique identifier like a social security number, but it doesn't apply when government does searches on those databases via other methods, like simply doing facial recognition matching, um, and it doesn't apply in many law enforcement contexts. So we have 
under-protected information, or we don't understand that information can be very revealing, even if it is not necessarily attached to our names. Secrecy versus privacy. Um, the Fourth Amendment doctrine has evolved to presume that information that's shared or is in the hands of third parties is information in which people don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy and therefore the constitutional protection does not apply. Yet every single person here shares something with some finite number of people and yet still expects it to be private. If we live with a roommate or a spouse, if we tell somebody a secret, whether it's our doctor or our clergyman, um, we believe that these things, <coughs> though they're not strictly secrets, other people may know them, are nevertheless sensitive and private and should be used in particular ways and not in other ways. Um, but our law, our Fourth Amendment law, has said, well, if somebody knows it, then it's not private and we're not going to protect it. And as a result of this doctrinal mistake underlying the Fourth Amendment, to this day, um, we aren't really confidently sure here in the United States that the content of our emails is protected by the Fourth Amendment because the emails are with third party communications providers. Um, similarly, our movements in public whether they're tracked with our cell phones or with GPS technology on our cars um, or a drone that's equipped with a video camera, those are movements that the Fourth Amendment um, does not seem to, to follow. So, you know, we need to know what the government is doing and we need a vehicle for judicial review and for public accountability for these things. Courts and the public should know what law enforcement does, and there should be penalties for breaking the law. And yet, we don't have vigorous reporting about these surveillance practices, and because of the way our standing doctrine works, and because of having to prove um, actual harm in order to have a court case, and because people aren't getting notice when they're surveilled, even when there's a law that would protect your privacy, people are having trouble enforcing that, and we're having trouble getting judicial review. So users are worried about abuse of their privacy. Correcting some of these uh, misconceptions or theoretical mistakes that underlie our privacy law is a critical step towards addressing that problem and making fee people feel comfortable about sharing their information online with businesses and by default with the government as well. Thank you. I will now introduce my co-moderator for today, Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen is the counselor and intellectual property rights attache to the Chinese embassy in the United States. Dr. Chen is a postdoctorate fellow of the intellectual property rights law program at the University of China and a standing member of the Chinese IPR Law Society as well as a member of the Chinese IPR Society and International Law Society, and a research fellow at the International IPR Research Center of the Peking University. He will introduce the remaining panelists, and we'll take a few questions from the floor after we start with a few questions from us on the panel as well. So please think of any questions you would like to ask. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, thank you, Professor Alisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we know, uh, nowadays, um, cyber security is becoming um, more and more important and uh, absorbed a lot of uh, attention here in the U.S. And also, uh, in March 15 this year, um, during the evening, evening um, party hosted by uh, CCTV for uh, for our international day for protection of our consumers. The programs has exposed some internet companies are suspected to use cookie to steal the privacy of the users. So the topics how to uh, protect privacy is also uh, very hot, very uh, popular mm -hmm. nowadays in China. So uh, I think it's rather important 
uh, we uh, discussed how to uh, make the balance to uh, promote the healthy uh, development of the internet and the protections of the users. Normally uh, speaking, I think that there are at least two kind of uh, aspects to uh, consider about these issues. The first one is to uh, take the point of uh, techni technicals. How to use the uh, technologies to uh, protect the privacy in the internet. And the second of course is uh, we uh, must to, uh, set up to use the legal uh, systems to have that to be worked. And a lot of uh, questions um, within that, for examples, the definitions of a privacy, how we can identify the specific scope of, uh, of that concept, and the principles of uh, protections of uh, privacy, and also the boundaries of uh, liability of uh, privacy. All in all, is a, I think it's a question for, for us to uh, consider. Hopefully, uh, we can get some uh, information, some ideas from our distinguished panelists this afternoon. Um, now, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Director Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee is a director and a researcher at the Regulation Division of the Policy and the Regulation Department under the MRIT. Mr. Lee is uh, uh, primarily uh, responsible for drafting legislations on telecommunications and the internet within that agency. Uh, Mr. Lee received a Master of Law degree and a doc doctor uh, degree uh, from uh, Peking University Law School. And his topics for today is uh, China's personal uh, electronic information protection systems. So, uh, Director Li, please. Hello, <coughs> 但是北京时间已经到了五月四号五月四号呢是北京大学的校庆纪念日那么在这个特别的日子里能够给大家一块分享一下中国的这个个人电子信息保护制度对我来说倍感荣幸那么我主要是想把就是中国这两年来在这个
呃，对这个公民个人电子信息的这个保护问题做出了规定。它一个方面呢是确定了保护的这个范围。我们当时呢就是立足于保护的，主要是从这个公民的这个身份信息这个角度呢，对个人电子信息进行保护。我们当时确定的这个范围呢，是这个与用户相关，能够单独或者通过或者与其他信息相结合，呃，能够这个识别用户的这个信息。那么这两类信息，我们认为呢，属于这个就是公民的个人电子信息。实际上，它这个范围主要是在这个身份信息的这个范围。那么这个规定的第二个方面呢，是规定了它收集的这个规则。呃，在这个就是国内其他的有关这个法律里面呢，可能呢没有这么集中的讲到了这个收集规则。我们在这个规定里面呢，做了一个比较明确的规定。我们主要是讲了四个方面的一个要求。一个呢是没有经过用户的同意，你不能够收集用户的个人信息。第二个呢就是说你要收集的话，当然是前提是要经用户同意了。那么你需要把你收集的这个目的，呃，就是收集的方式和这个收集的用途，要告知这个用户，让这个用户呢作为一个权利人，就信息的权利人，他能够有一个知情权。第三个方面呢，就是我们规定呢。是你不能收集这个服务以外的、超出你这个服务限度的一些信息，这是一个就是确定的一个范围。我记得就是这个案例呢，曾经呢，我们有一些用户呢，对于咱们安卓系统，这个包括苹果的 iOS 系统，那么收集用户个人信息的行为呢，曾经提出过质疑。后来呢，我们研究过这个，就是说苹果这个 iOS 系统和这个安卓系统的这个。用户协议，实际上呢，它在这里面是有明确约定的。第四个方面呢，是你不得将这个收集的这个信息呢，用于提供服务之外。这四个方面呢，是我们规定的一个收集的一个原则。第三个方面呢，我们这个规定呢，还提到了，那么你收集完了之后，怎么去使用这些信息？那么这个信息你收集来了，你那个使用的时候呢，需要遵守一定的规定。在我们这个规呃规定里面呢，明确的要求，就是未经用户同意，或者是法律行政法规的规定，呃，大大家注意，就是说我们这个规定呢，主要是限定的这个法律如果有明确规定的话，是指法律和行政法规，主要是在中央立法这个方面。那么如果有这个规定呢，我们说如果除非经过用户的同意或者法律行政法规的规定，你不能够把这个用户呢提供给第三方。这是一个明确性的约束。第四个方面呢，就是这个规定呢，还还规定了一些保护的义务，就是信息提供者，你收集了这个信信息以后呢，呃，我们说你要履行三个方面的保护义务。第一个呢，你要妥善的保管这些信息，不能够让这些信息呢随意的被窃取，或者是被第三方呢呃拿到。呃，这个呢，去年上半年呢，曾经呢有一个这个公共平台。出现过，就是他在这个用户把这个信息收集来了之后呢，没有进行很妥善的保管，最后导致呢数以千万计的这个用户的信息呢被泄露，这个呢造成的这种影响比较大。所以针对这一点呢，我们加强了一个法律保护。第二个方面的要求呢，是要求你如果说这个你如果已经发现，就是这个服务商，你已经发现你的信息，你收集的信息已经被泄露。或者可能被泄露的，那么你应当呢立即采取补救措施，就是采取一些技术上或者管理上的一些补救措施，防止这个它造成的这个危害的呢进一步扩大。第三个呢是，如果说已经造成了不良后果，造成了严重后果的，你应当呢立即向有关主管部门来报告。我们工信部呢作为这个行业管理部门，嗯、呃，在这一块上呢负有这样监督管理的职责。我们要求呢。这个服务提供商呢，应当向我们做出一个报告，同时呢，就是要采取相应的一些补救措施。这个呢，是我们这个就是我们这个规范互联网信息服务市场秩序若干规定的一些具体的一些要求。那么我们理解呢，这个规定呢，是我们迄今为止在国内在电信和互联网领域，呃，最为集中的对个人信息保护的一个规定，到目前为止。那么此后呢？今年十二月份呢，全国人大常委会发布了一个关于加强
呃网络信息保护的决定。那么这个决定呢，也就这个呃公民的个人电子信息保护的问题做出了规定。一会儿呢，我们这个周教授呢还会就这个问题可能跟大家分享。那么我就不多做太多的这个解释。那么这个规定呢，在起草过程中。这个决定呢，在起草过程中呢，曾经呢就是征求了我们的意见。那么这个起草呢，主体的性的条款呢是我们提供的。呃，这个就是从内容上来讲呢，这个人大决定呢，比我们部的这个刚刚才我讲到的这个规定呢，它的法律等级更高一些。呃，那么但是规定呢，基本主体性制度是一致的，可能有存在着两点的不同。一个呢，就是我们保护的范围。这个全国人大的这个规定呢，这个决定呢，把保护范围呢，从这个身份信息扩及到隐私信息的一个保护，这是一个范围的扩大。第二个方面呢，就是它这个手艺是呃这个收集使用的这个原则，在这里面有一个明确的规定，我们在此前的规决呃规定里面呢是没有的。也就是说，你人大的这个决定呢，要求呢，你收集和使用这个公民的个人电子信息，你要遵循一个。合法、正当和必要这么一个原则，这是这个为呃这个比较大的一个不同。我想介绍的这个第三个东西呢，就是说我们现在呃已经实施了一个标准，就是在此之前是没有的。从今年的二月一号开始呢，我们工业和信息化部呃牵头呢制定了一个标准。那么这个标准呢，对我们这个就是说这个个人信息保护问题呢，也做出了一个规定。那么这是这个目前我们这个立法的这个情况。那么关于下一步，下一步呢，我们想呢，就是作为个人信息保护的问题呢，应该还有一个，应该有一个更重要的系统性的一个法律呢，做出规定。所以呢，我们建议呢，推动出台这个个人信息保护法。在这个基础上呢，我们部呢也起草了一个电信和互联网用户个人信息保护规定。目前呢，呃，正在这个互联网上对社会公开征求意见。我们期望呢，能够在上半年呢推动出台这个决定，呃，这个规定。那么这个规定呢，如果能顺利出台的话，将会以工信部、工业和信息化部部门规章的这个形式呢发布。好，我今天介绍就这么，谢谢。呃、uh, ，Thanks, uh, Director Lin, and uh, our ne next speaker is uh, Professor Wang Xixin. Professor Wang is a vice dean. And the director of uh, the Centers for Public Participation Studies and the support at uh, Peking University Law School. Uh, Professor Wang um, was used to be a visiting uh, scholar to uh, Columbia Law School and uh, uh, Yale Law School in the US. Professor Wang has been deeply involved in China's administrative law reform for many years. And he is also uh, recognized as a public uh, uh, intellectual, having served as a commentator for China Legal Daily and also CCTV. Professor Wang received his uh, LLB from uh, South Central Institute of Political Science and Law. And uh, he uh, received his LLM, LLD degree from uh, Peking University. Professor Wang, please. Um, I want to talk about the 我们每个人都想知道关于别人的更多的信息，但同时也希望让别人知道关于自己的更少的信息。它产生了一个矛盾。那其实事实是，所有的人都是在裸奔，大家都是没有没有什么隐私的，因为这个对对这个所有信息的威胁呢，一方面来自于技术或公司，比如说这个 Dan。刚才谈到的就是个人的隐私和个个人的信息，更多的会受到来自这些技术的威胁。他提出的建议就是，我们自己要熟悉和了解这些技术，然后我们自己要去加密等等。
很显然，这个对我们对我们有些人来说，这是非常困难的。呃，当然，另外一方面，对个人的信息和个人的隐私的威胁是来自于政府。这个呢，我觉得在中国啊，这也是比较突出的一个问题，因为可以通过政府，可以通过一些法律上义务的分配，让这些 ISP 他们来负责监管，他们来获得这些信息，所以。每一个人在今天看来都受到来自技术的、来自权力的这种对个人隐私的威胁。呃，很多时候这两者是结合在一起的，所以它是呃，应该说对个人的隐私构成了巨大挑战。但我今天要谈的呢，可能还想啊，在这两个方面之外，我想谈的是第三个可能性，那就是我们都知道，如果我们了解技术的话，其实我们会非常害怕。这个互联网，因为一旦你上去以后，你是没有隐私的。但是在中国，其实还有另外一个非常有意思的现象，就是，官员他也是非常害怕互联网的，啊，你你官员他们非常怕互联网，因为对这个官员的这种信息，包括他的个人信息或者是隐私呢，有可能是通过网络的用户。而影响到他，比如说比较典型的就是通过这个人肉搜索，对吧？呃，以及通过这个网络用户各种各样的信息采集和和聚集，就构成了关于这些官员和公众人物啊，他们的许多身份信息、隐私信息的泄露。所以我想要谈的就是我们讲的这个第三个维度。那么隐私的问题，前面已经谈到很多，就是我们啊，怎么样在互联网的时代，通过技术的啊手段，通过这种法律的手段来限制。但是，在中国，我想在在别的地方，包括在自己国家，在美国，可能也会碰到，那就是对官员这种隐私权，以及这种网络用户或者民众对政府、对官员的监督。知情权、监督权到底是一种什么样的关系？我想简要的提到这几个方面。那么在中国的情况呢，就是首先今天大家都在谈隐私保护，特别在互联网的时代谈隐私保护，但是隐私权无论是在学理上，还是在法律的规定中，其实都不是一个清晰的概念。在学理上呢，中国的学者通常都认为隐私权它是人格权利的一种。主要的界定呢，大概涉及到三个要素。第一个，隐私权是与个人的身份和他的私人生活有关的信息，这是第一个。第二呢，个人的这种信息是不是构成隐私，可能还涉及到与公共利益的关系。换句话说，如果有些信息它是个人的，但同时它也是与公共利益有关的，那么这样的信息。有可能不属于隐私，而是应该对公众公开的。第三个界定呢，中国的这些呃学者呢，通常都认为隐私权它是一种人格权啊。那么这是在学理上的界定，但在法律上啊、呃，前面这个呃李处长谈到了，中国有很多的法律提到了这种隐私的保护。其实，呃，首先我们在中国一九八二年的宪法中就提到了这个人格尊严的保护。那么，民法通则呢规定了名誉权。最高法院对这个民法通则实施的解释中，实际上是将隐私权的保护啊放到名誉权，啊放到名誉权的保护中来，也就是用名誉权来保护隐私。那么除除了这些法律的规定之外，其实还包括中国的刑法典，也明确规定了，呃，如果泄露个个人的信息或者隐私。有可能要承担刑事责任啊，所以如果你看这个法律的规定来看，它的保护层级是很高的，在宪法层面上，在民法层面，还有在刑法典的层面，都是有很多法律的保护。嗯，这是关于隐私的这种学理上的概念和在法律上的规定。但是，尽管有了这些学理上的概念和法律上的规定呢。隐私的保护和个人信息的保护，在过去几十年的发展中，应该说
依然是非常缓慢的，啊，我想主要的这个中国对隐私权这种法律上的保护经历了三个阶段。首先呢，是一九八七年中国的民法通则的实施，那这个实施以后呢，基本上建立起来的是对隐私权的替代保护。所谓替代保护，就是基本上隐私权的保护呢，是通过保护名誉权。来实施的，所以在中国大量的涉及到个人信息和隐私权的法院的判例啊，主要是名誉权的诉讼啊，其实是这是在第一个阶段。第二个阶段呢，就是呃我们的侵权责任法里面，那么侵权责任法的第二条呢，是明确的规定了对个人隐私的保护，但是对个人隐私的范围到底是多大，并没有进行界定。第三个阶段呢，就是刚才。李处长谈到的，在二零一二年的十二月，中国的全国人大常委会通过了保护个人信息的这样一个决定，它相当于一个法律。那么这个呢，第三个阶段就是确定了中国的对隐私权，特别是互联网时代隐私啊这种个人信息和个人隐私的保护。那。在法律上确定这些之后呢，我们可以看到，现在如果涉及到对这种个人隐私和个人信息的保护，首要的这种保护的义务主体，可能是政府，还有一些机构，比如说银行、电信公司，啊，房屋的登记管理机构，所以它包括政府，它包括一些公营的一些机构，当然第三个也包括许多的这个互联网公司。那这些主体在负有保护个人隐私和信息的这种义务的时候，他们主要的义务形式呢？第一个是他们的信息采集过程中的一些义务。那么，当当他们采集个人信息的时候，全国人大常委会的决定要求是要符合合法、正当和必要这三个原则。在采集之后呢，第二个阶段的这个保护义务呢，是涉及到的就是。所谓的管理义务，当这些公司、这些互联网机构他们获得这些信息的时候，他们不能够去未经同意去转让、去出卖这些信息。但是，可能还有一个很重要的，就是这些互联网的机构保留了、保存了大量的个人信息，但有可能是因为技术上的原因，这些信息有可能泄露。因此，管理过程中的信息保护也是一个重要的阶段。那第三个，第三个这些公司负有的保护义务呢，其实就是呃事后的救济，啊，事后的救济就可能涉及到我今天要谈的啊一个我要聚焦的主题。所谓事后的救济，就是当网络的用户，网络用户在这个互联网的平台上进行发言、进行表达的时候。他们的表达内容有可能涉及到其他公民的个人信息，甚至是个人的隐私。那么这时候，作为网络网络服务提供者的这个 ISP， 他们也负有责任。这种责任就是，他们可能需要去删除这些所谓的侵害个人隐私的信息，并且有可能采取一些补救性的手段去消除影响。这样的规定呢，其实给 ISP 提供了一个非常大的一种一种权利，当然也是一种责任，对吧？那么在这个背景中，其实可能就涉及到就官员的官员的问题，因为在今天呢，中国的互联网有一个很重要的功能，就是民众把它当做是监督政府、监督官员的一个平台，民众把它是当做一个反腐败的平台，所以很多时候一旦出现。各种各样的事件，那么互联网是一个非常重要的信息收集、信息发布的这样一个平台，而这些信息都涉及到官员个人。有些官员个人的信息可能是属于应当公开的，但是有些信息呢，应该说是有争议的。比如说，在一个个案中，一个官员记载了他和他的属下、一些女下属有各种各样的这种不正当的关系。那么，当这个事件曝光以后，网网络的使用者就通过人肉搜索，搜索的不是这个官员个人的信息，而是他的那些女下属的信息。这些信息在互联网上公开了
。还有一些信息，今天也在进行很多的讨论。比如说，我们为了监督官员，那许多人去搜索这个官员的房产、他们的家庭住址、他们的电话号码，所有这些信息，它带来的问题就是这样的一些信息，到底是属于官员个人的私密的，还是与公共利益？有很大的关联度，因而必须是公开的。所以在互联网的时代，不仅仅是普通的公民个人，他们涉及到个人信息和个人隐私的保护问题。我觉得对于官员来说，那么像这个原来在美国的《纽约时报》书《沙利文案》里面所提出的官员和公众人物的理论，如何在中国进行一个具体化的实践，这也是中国的互联网时代我们必须考虑的问题。谢谢大家。呃、uh, ，Thanks, uh, Professor Wang. A lot of uh, information, uh, a little bit uh, more time. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Zhou Hanhua. Uh, Professor Zhou is uh, a research at uh, the Institute of Law of the Chinese Academy of Social Science. Uh, Professor Zhou has over 20 years of research and uh, practical experience in the area of laws and administrative regulations. Uh, he has participated in many uh, law-making, um, policy-making process, including the administrative law, uh, licensing law, the state liability law, the energy law, the food safety law, and e-signature law in China. Professor Zhou has uh, obtained his uh, bachelor degree from Wuhan University and uh, his uh, master doctor of law degrees from uh, Chinese Academy of Social Science. Professor Zhou was also uh, a senior visiting uh, scholarship at uh, Yo Law School in uh, 2000. Um, his uh, topic is uh, to uh, focus on the new uh, decisions from our People's Congress. So, uh, Professor Zhou, please. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to participate in uh, this conference, and it is also very dangerous to be a fellow speaker of the afternoon session. So I will try to be short and brief. Uh, it's very interesting to discuss privacy between the uh, United States and China. You know, it's hard to find something in common between these two countries. But privacy might be an exception because both countries does, don't have comprehensive press, privacy law yet. One year ago, President Obama uh, issued the Consumer uh, Privacy Bill of Rights. So, the, Anisha, uh, when you made the announcement, you raised several questions. Who will be pushed for the, the law? What to put inside the law? Uh, how and what and, uh, and why and etc. So, my talk will try to tackle uh, these issues regarding who, when, how, uh, why and etc. Uh, in China, because the, as uh, Director Li and Professor Wang uh, both mentioned, uh, China's NPC made a decision at the end of last year. The decision is equivalent to a law, but it's very short. It's not a law yet. But from that decision, uh, it shed light on the possible further development in China regarding privacy law. So I will try to, to answer uh, several questions, uh, as I mentioned earlier. First one is who. Uh, who are pushing forward for the lawmaking in China? Well, everyone knows that the internet is a multi-stakeholder structure. So companies, media, government agencies, uh, MIT uh, the directly is, work, is affiliated with has been playing a very big role. But there are also many other different players. Uh, the, the decision adopted by the NPC last year actually was adopted by NPC itself. 
independent of government agencies at all. So the leaders of the Legal Working Committee uh, emphasizes for many, many times that the NPC in, uh, uh, adopted uh, this decision by itself without, without any influence from any other parties. It's true, but it's not totally true. Uh, because the media also plays a certain role. Uh, maybe someone uh, uh, aware of the, the uh, one law promulgated by the Singapore uh, last October uh, for the purpose of having more cloud computing business in Singapore. So Singapore promulgated the that law in October. And that one Chinese newspaper covered the that story with a very short paper. And that paper was read by some, some very high-ranking leaders. They said, well, it's a good idea, because that law provides the safeguards uh, for consumers from the spam. So they, so they was uh, instruction. They say, we put one more thing in that decision. That is anti-spam. Also, scholars and the government agencies Quite a few government agencies uh, did involve in the, the whole process, but the NPC once and once uh, insisted that the NPC adopted the law by itself, which was uh, similar to the uh, Criminal Law Amendment Seven adopted in two thousand nine, which is also a, 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 a proactive action by NPC. So I think this is a very good scenario. Uh, that means in China now there are uh, multi-stakeholder uh, drivers or impetus for law development, which is very good. This uh, answers who. And the second question is when. Lots of people would always raise the question, when China will have a privacy law, which is very difficult to answer because there are many uncertainties. Uh, to my knowledge, even, in the, even for the next five-year session of NPC, privacy, privacy law uh, is still very difficult to put into the legislative agenda due to different understandings regarding the importance of this law. But on the other hand, if you have followed the decision-making process, you will notice uh, several unique characteristics by that decision. For example, the draft was not made public like any other draft of law. And uh, the, the decision was passed with only one reading rather than three readings provided in the Legislation Act. And one more characteristic is that the decision was valid, was effective from the day of promulgation, which is also very unique. So you can see that the whole process is very quick. Actually, uh, I was asked to provide the first draft. And they asked me, to provide, I provide only one pages, only one pages, several clauses for that decision. I told them as I couldn't do that because I needed the team to, to have a comprehensive draft uh, eight years ago. They said, well, you have to help us to do this, only in several clauses. That, that, I actually answered the, 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 the puzzle raised by Director Lee. He said there are, they are, they, they are some new things. That is principle-driven structure in that decision. So we, I, I made some uh, comparative research and summarized several principles, which now is the structure for, 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 for the decision. But uh, still, I provide a whole page, one page of, of draft. And finally, they cut it to half a page, only four or five clauses. So you can see that the whole process could be very quick. It could be time consuming. You can never expect what will happen. So that is the uncertainty, the when. 
And the third question is what? What are the concerns for the decision maker? And what are the concerns for general consumer or, or the public? Uh, in the decision, actually it provides uh, crosses for three areas. One is privacy, second is spam. The third one, which has not been uh, mentioned today, is the so-called real name system, real name registration system. So you can see the law always will cover the areas that are interesting for the consumers or for the business, as well as for the decision makers. So what? So we can see in the future if the privacy law, what will, what will be incorporated into the privacy law, there will be a, a wide space for discussion. And uh, the fourth question is how? How, is, how to evaluate the decision? I think there are many, many good points or credit for this decision. One, as directly mentioned, also mentioned, is a principle-driven structure. So the principle of uh, notice, the principle of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of openness, transparency, and et cetera. Not so technical, it's a principle-driven structure. And uh, also, uh, for the first time, define what is PII. So there are many good things in, in the decision, but still there are lots of uh, shortcomings and other things. I will not elaborate on that, because the time is open. And, uh, and also, how is the reaction from different aspects? Well, for certain areas uh, that are covered by the decision, it's warmly welcomed by the public, like privacy protection, spam. But uh, there have been lots of debate regarding especially real name registration system. And uh, how is the enforcement? That is very sad. Uh, you know, the real name registration system actually adopted from the end of last year for Weibo or the Twitter, Chinese Twitter. But the enforcement is, is, is not so good. And this decision now is more than, more than four or five months. Still, you can receive uh, spam every day, telephone call and the commercial promotion. So, so we have a lot to do. And we, we are trying to, to, to answer all these questions. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Zhou, for your uh, 4W1H speech. So uh, now, uh, it's a Q&A. So uh, if you have questions, uh, please line up at the microphones and we'll take them shortly. We're going to end the panel at 5.50. Let me just start out really quickly for some of the panelists. Uh, we heard all sorts of wonderful things today and I loved some of the stories of how similar the issues we're facing are. And we're talking, of course, a great deal about law. So my question is to any of you, uh, we've talked about passing better laws, about using the right technology and crypto and math. We've talked about the power of the transparency of seeing what lawmakers themselves do and about the value of a multi-stakeholder process to get many voices. What do you think is the best approach we can take toward privacy over the next five years? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, so from my perspective, again, I'm a tech guy. This is the most dressed up I've ever been. Um, I think that technology moves much more quickly than legal protections. And if we can get a technological communications infrastructure that prioritizes privacy, um, I think that is the, the best way forward. There are lots of challenges, as, uh, as many have noted, including uh, Dr. Wang, but um, I think that it is a, a promising path, and that's what I hope uh, we're able to achieve in the next five years. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I think that, uh, you know, for one thing, you can definitely um, to uh, help, you know, individuals to uh, strengthen their technology. Um, because, you know, if you know more, you, you'll be more careful. So uh, as some, some cases that demonstrated by, uh, by Dan, that, uh, you know, if you really know that how technology works, then uh, obviously you are uh, uh, getting better to, to be self-protected. However, I do believe that for the, for the common um, for, for common people, it will be very, um, I think, cost benefitly um, expensive and, and te technologically uh, challenging for them to, you know, increase their technology to be uh, to get them uh, self-protected. Uh, with that said, I believe that uh, two things uh, we call the legal approach will be um, will be very important. By legal approach, uh, at least you know, in, 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 China, in the case of China, I, I, I think that uh, the first aspect of legal approach to uh, protect privacy for individual citizens is that to, uh, to take the law enforcement much more seriously. Because, because, you know, we already have had so many legislations, you know, scattered in the Constitution, in the, you know, Supreme Court, uh, judicial interpretations and also in the in the criminal code however you know there there has there has been too big discount of law enforcement and that that is a big problem there there are also some legal um, problems in for for the process because if you an individual citizen find a case before chinese people's court then there is a problem for you know for the burden of proof, how to prove, you know, uh, the torts, um, and I think that uh, um, the, the, this legislation needs to be much more specific, uh, so that uh, it will be um, easier to be enforced. But I think that the enforcement will be um, will be um, uh, the most important thing. Now, the second one is you just you just make all the legislations more you know more specific instead of being very general like the, the current situation. Thank you. I want to make one more comment. Uh, I think you have to find the, the unique solution to unique circumstances. The, uh, to my own experience, more research I do, more confused I become. So I don't know whether we can predict what the digital life will be like in five years. It's very hard to predict that thing. So you, the, 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 I think it's the ad hoc strategy or tactic to find a solution. Thank you. Uh, I uh, do have uh, several uh, questions, but uh, the time is uh, so limited. Uh, I think we need to finish at uh, 5.50. So I noticed there are so many uh, uh, questions. So I suggest that we take all the questions at one time. And we will ask our panelists to choose to give you know, the answers. So uh, please. <音>我的问题是给三位那个国内来的嘉宾 使用你的信息，那我想说，就是对于这个转让和出卖的时候，假设我的用户协议里写的是这个公司可以为了公司正当的这个就是商业目的来使用你的信息的话，这是不是一种默认的允许？ 我公司可以出售你的信息，因为我经常跟第三方合作，出售这样对于我公司也是一种商业的需求。还是说需要一个非常明确的告示用户说 
呃，我会出售你的信息，这才算一个那个许可。那我的第二个问题其实也相关，关于这个互联网呃公司的这个用户协议的合法性，因为在美国现在有不同的案例就出来说，就是如果有时候把你的用户协议隐藏在网络一个非常隐秘的地方，那其实这个时候用户并没有得到这个通知，所以并不代表这个用户协议也是合法的。那么我想中国是不是有相应的案例或者？明确规定说怎么样的形式呈现给的用户协议才算合法？谢谢。Thanks for your questions, and I suggest this line first to give your questions. Then we move to the next line, please. Um, when privacy advocates in the United States um, talk about privacy, sometimes they are told that it's not a universal value, that in other countries it's not valued as much. And sometimes China is given as an example, and we're told it's a country that cares more about family, people know more about each other than they're in each other's faces more often. Um, what I've heard from you suggests that the Chinese people, and I, I realize I'm generalizing here, care a lot about privacy. So do you think that the norms are changing? Is China becoming more privacy prote protective, or were those people wrong all along? Thank you. Um, so this is a question for, for Dan and for Jennifer. Um, I've, I've had some fun trying to explain the American approach to privacy in Europe over the past year. And I keep hearing the same sort of very basic set of objections. Um, which are augments to what you've both said, um, but I'd like to hear your, your takes on them. Um, the first is that the, um, the model that Dan put out, which is to defend and inform, right? Learn what you need to do and then protect yourself. Um, and the response that I get in Europe is, yeah, right, so defend turns into an arms race. Um, and information um, doesn't explain why Johnny still can't encrypt. Um, this leads then to the, some of the substantive loopholes that, that Jennifer mentioned, some of the real substantive problems that we've gotten wrong. And so this is just a, a bit slightly more of a legal question. Um, why is it then that in the wild west of American privacy protection, fine if self-defense, technological self-defense doesn't seem to be quite working out, legal self-defense doesn't seem to be working either, and the mistake in the mechanism seems to be this, that privacy invading terms communicated by a web server are enforceable as a matter of law, right? Your privacy policies, your EULAs. But privacy terms communicated by a consumer's web browser are simply not. C, do not track and kind of what's become of it. Um, is there anything we can do about that would be my second question. Thank you. 啊、uh, ，因为我的问题是给李先生的，所以我就用中文来问了。啊、uh, ，我的第一个问题就是，刚才您提到工信部的规定里面有说到，这个信息不能用于服务之外的用途。但是，比如说像我现在在淘宝上，淘宝每个月都会发一个账单给我，列出每一项我在淘宝上买的东西。那假如我不想淘宝跟踪我的这个信息。但是我也没有办法选择不要这个账单服务，所以我现在的问题就是，现在很多的互联网商他们提供的是一个综合平台化的服务，有很多东西是搭售在一起，用户没有办法选择不要的服务。那这样子的话，很多互联网商他通过这样的办法就能够把用户很多的信息纳入他的服务之内的范围。所以我想问，在现在的这样综合平台化服务发展的趋势之下，究竟所谓不得使用于服务？之外的用途，这样的定义对于保护隐私究竟是不是真的有意义？那我的第二个问题就是呢，你刚才谈到很多是关于这个在处置之前的程序、收集的合法性的程序，但是一个法律它如果要有效的话，要有牙咬能咬人才能够有效。所以我想问，像工信部或者是人大，那对于在以互联网公司的这个。侵犯隐私权的法则方面有什么样的考量？有什么样的措施？譬如说，严重的会不会达到就是会取消这个互联网公司的这个营业执照？像是这样的问题，谢谢。Okay, so please. Hi, my name is Morgan Wyland. I'm a JD PhD here at Stanford. Thanks for taking my question.、Um, it kind of builds on one of the prior questions from the other side, so that might be helpful. And 
also on the idea that one of the panelists mentioned about the definition of privacy and how it's somewhat obscure or opaque about exactly what we're talking about. And I think it's important to try to understand what the definition of privacy is that we're working with because prior to being a legal concept, it's very much a social or cultural construction. So I would be very interested to have you all weigh in on what commonalities you think might exist between Chinese and American conceptions of privacy, as well as what differences exist. I mean, there clearly are differences. I think one of you pointed to perhaps disagreements with the Sullivan holding, which would be very fundamental in US law. So in as much as there are differences and commonalities, I would love to hear you weigh in. Thanks. Thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I have two questions. The first one regarding the governmental surveillance. Um, in the past two decades, there are certain convergence between the United States and China. It's not necessary that China become more and more like the United States. But sometimes the United States become more and more like China, and one area I notice is the governmental surveillance. So I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about uh, the national security ladders after 9-11 and the domestic use of drones. Um, also a related question would be, uh, what's the rule that uh, civil liberty groups like EPIC, EFF, and um, ACLU can or would play in this scenario. Um, 第二个问题的话是主要针对中方的嘉宾中国也没有对这个网络言论在隐私方面有着特殊的限制就是我们的第一个人肉搜索案子的判案恰恰是针对这个一个非常普通的一个个人就是所谓的王菲案所以我希望能听一听各位嘉宾对这个问题的看法谢谢 you are so many uh, questions it's uh, totally uh, nine questions and it's uh, used almost up our times <laughs> but, but, but I suggest you know, uh, uh, I will uh, open uh, the floor for our panelists uh, to uh, let each one to have one minute to uh, answer, to pick, you know, either questions from among these nine questions. And uh, after that, if uh, you still want to uh, discuss with them, so uh, feel free uh, to, uh, to come to discuss with them after we close this panel. So uh, from, uh, from uh, them, you are first. Okay. okay, great. Um, I'll address the third and sixth uh, speakers' questions. Um, so I, th I believe the third question was about uh, the problem of toss and the disparity between a website being able to, to have a user click through a toss agreement, but a user not being able to, to tell a website, hey, I don't want to be tracked. Um, and just really quickly, I agree this is a big problem. It's, it's lopsided power, and the toss <laughs> is kind of this really twisted version of a contract or in power, in practice it's become this twisted version of a contract where one side has all the power. Uh, so I agree that's a big problem. I think that um, that's something to, to work on and we need to fight back against. And for the sixth speaker, uh, he asked about uh, NSLs and domestic use of drones and uh, what the role of organizations like mine at EFF are. And I think combating state surveillance is a top priority and we intend to do that uh, it, technologically as much as we can. We also have a, a case uh, against the NSA that's been going on for quite some time. Um, and it, I don't know if you saw, but there was a recent NSL case which uh, uh, a district court ruled NSL is unconstitutional. So that's exciting for us. So we just intend to continue pushing on all these as much as possible. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you. Um, so I think that the, we have to think in resolving privacy, we have to understand that privacy is not one megalithic thing. 
This is a constellation of values, the right to be left alone, the right to control how data about you is used, um, that information about you will not be misused for discriminatory purposes or to treat different classes of people differently. And similarly, the solutions have to be varied as well. The solutions for protecting privacy in the commercial space and what the role of terms of service or privacy policies are there have to be different from the solutions that apply in the law enforcement context, there's just completely different um, threats, completely different values there. And similarly, technology, like encryption, can only do so much to protect you. Encryption is not going to protect the data that you share with Facebook, for example, because that information is stuff that you want 700 of your closest friends to be able to read. So we need to have uh, um, law and technology complement each other in protecting people's privacy in, against either misuse or the right to be left alone, the right to free, free speech, and understand that there, are, that there are differences and we need to be very specific and, and um, thoughtful about how we do it in each category, lest either privacy be infringed or free speech be impacted or a commercial innovation be stifled. Thank you. 呃，我来回答一下这个刚才提问的这个用户协议的这个问题。其实在这个用户协议里，有可能会有一个一揽子的一个，就是给予服务提供者一个授权性的条款。那么怎么理解这个条款的合法性呢？其实在这个立法过程
between the 360 versus Tencent. The core question at that time was whether Tencent invaded privacy of its user. So in China, the general trend is very, has been very clear. Traditionally, we only had the concept of shameful secret, secrecy. That is the traditional idea. We call this the shameful secret. And in the 80s, then we have the new concept of privacy, which is a kind of civil law rights. And then after uh, the century, 21st century, the new concept, personal information, emerged. And the decision adopted by the NPC actually for the first time defined the PII. And that is quite clear, what is PII. So if we use the, 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 the personal information, it will be much easier to define uh, versus privacy, which is a very contentious concept. Thank you uh, for our, our distinguished uh, panelists. Thanks for uh, the interpreters working in the back, and thank you for your attention. I would like to invite my uh, co-moderator to say a few words to close this panel. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just echo you. This has been a very interesting day for me. I hope it has been for all of you as well. And also echo the invitation if you have additional questions and wish to speak with the panelists for a few moments, I hope that they will make themselves available. Thank you all very much. <laughs>